First, just to start an outline of what I hope to cover today. First, just a little bit of a refresher about IBD. We'll talk a little bit about the differences between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's and a few words on its pathogenesis. The bulk of the talk is really going to be on the treatment circa 2011. We'll talk a little bit about the risks and benefits of different treatment options. Later in the talk, I, I want to spend some time talking about some of the currently debated questions in the treatment um, of Crohn's, and then I'll conclude with some thoughts on future directions. So as you all know, IBD um, is characterized by chronic intestinal inflammation. Um, it primarily includes two diseases, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Ulcerative colitis is primarily limited uh, to the colonic mucosa. Um, it usually will start in the rectum and extend proximally in a continuous distribution. The proximal extent can vary from person to person. When it's limited to the rectum, it's called proctitis. But as I said, it can, it can actually extend to any, to any point in the colon. When it involves the whole colon, we call it pancolitis. Um, there's a wide spectrum of disease severity in ulcerative colitis. This is a, a colonoscopy that's showing normal mucosa. This could be mild UC, moderate, and severe where there's extensive ulceration. In Crohn's disease, um, the inflammation is transmural. Um, it can affect any part of the GI tract from the mouth to the anus. There's typically rectal sparing, and in 80% of patients, there's small bowel involvement, um, and it's characterized by skip lesions. The fact that the inflammation is transmural is important. Um, it actually uh, predisposes patients who have Crohn's to have complications that patients with ulcerative colitis aren't really at risk for, um, including fibrosis and stricture formation that can result in obstruction, um, as well as sinus tract formation that can penetrate the serosa and result in fistula development. Uh, fistula basically is when there's an abnormal communication between two organs that can be bowel to bowel, bowel to skin, um, bowel to bladder, bowel to vagina. Um, other complications can include microperforation with abscess formation. Um, as with UC, there can be a wide spectrum of disease severity. Up here in the upper left, um, mild Crohn's with a few scattered aphthous ulcers and some normal intervening mucosa. In these two pictures, more moderate Crohn's. Um, here you see a pretty significant punched out ulcer and a linear ulcer. Um, and down here on the lower right, um, severe Crohn's with extensive ulceration, deep ulcers, um, some patchy normal mucosa leading to sort of what we refer to as a gobble, cobblestone appearance. So we talked a little bit about the features and the characteristics of these diseases, but what do we know about what causes them? Um, we don't know 100%, but it's thought to be the result of an interplay between uh, a genetic predisposition, an environmental tr trigger, and a faulty immune system, such that in, an individual who has that genetic predisposition, if they're exposed to a particular environmental trigger, um, their gut immune system overreacts with an overreactive mucosal inflammatory response that can result in IBD. So for the rest of the talk, I'm really going to focus on Crohn's. Um, before we get into the details of treatment, um, I just want to uh, refresh your memories about some of the common manifestations of symptoms of Crohn's. Um, active Crohn's patients can have diarrhea, rectal bleeding, abdominal pain, weight loss, fever, fatigue, and then there are some extra intestinal manifestations. The disease is really characterized by periods of flare alternating with periods of remission. Um, and there's an associated very high lifetime risk of surgery. It's important to remember that surgery is not curative for Crohn's, um, and it's believed to have an 80% lifetime risk of surgery. Um, this graph sort of shows you how that risk increases over time, and after about 10 years of disease, there's a close to 50% risk for first surgery. So maintaining patients in remission is something that's very important in the treatment of Crohn's. Um, that's in part because um, there's data to suggest that previous disease activity can predict future disease activity. So the better we are able to maintain somebody in remission, the less likely they are to have a future flare. So what are some of our, um, so what are the goals that we have uh, for treatment? Um, we obviously want to get people to feel better. Um, we want to in induce and maintain remission. Um, we want to prevent complications. That includes complications from the disease as well as uh, complications related to therapy. Um, we want to improve and maintain quality of life. We'd like to limit surgery. Um, and then a newer potential goal is mucosal healing. Um, this is something that um, is relatively newly discussed as a, as a treatment goal, and I'll actually have more words on that towards the end. 
So as we talk about treatment, I think it's important to remember that while our goal for all these patients is the same, to induce and maintain remission, um, um, one size does not fit all. There's a wide spectrum of disease severity, and it's always important to carefully weigh risks and benefits of, of medical options. This slide is just an overview slide of the medical options that we have. Um, Sulfasalazine and mesalamine are anti-inflammatory medications that can be used for both induction and maintenance. Steroids, as you can see, is something that we use for induction, but it's not in the maintenance category. It shouldn't be used for maintenance. Um, azathioprine, 6-MP, and methotrexate are uh, uh, immunomodulators. They're typically slower in onset, so when they're used for induction, it's typically in combination with a steroid, and they are frequently used for maintenance. And then the biologics, like the anti-TNFs that we'll talk about, um, can be used for both. So I'm going to go into more detail about all these medical therapies with you, um, and for each each group, I'll do so sort of in the context of, of a case. So our first case is that of a 22-year-old male who has a four-week history of bloody diarrhea, um, some mild abdominal pain. Um, he has a colonoscopy, images shown here, and he has some biopsies, um, and the findings are consistent with mild Crohn's colitis. His gastroenterologist recommends that he start an oral 5-ASA. So as I mentioned, the 5-ASAs are anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, these principally include sulfasalazine and mesalamine. Sulfasalazine is the oldest uh, 5-ASA that we have. Um, it's a 5-ASA that's bonded to a sulfapyridine moiety, which is what enables it to, have, um, to be appropriately delivered, but it's also responsible for some of the side effects of the medication. The mesalamines are newer formulations that are without that sulfapyridine, um, and they're better tolerated. Um, they come in a number of oral formulations, as well as uh, uh, rectal suppository um, and enema. So these drugs, are actu they actually have a, a really well-established established role for treating ulcerative colitis, um, and they are frequently used for the treatment of Crohn's disease. Um, but I think it's important to just take a look at some of the data um, for 5-ASAs and Crohn's. So Sulfasalazine is uh, felt to be better than placebo, and the data supports that. Um, there are, most of the studies on sulfasalazine were done in the 70s and 80s. Um, one large study found that there was a 43% remission rate with sulfasalazine compared to a remission rate of about 30% with placebo. Um, other studies have had up to about a 50% remission rate. Importantly, studies don't show that it's con been consistently effective for small bowel disease. Um, and as I mentioned, up to about 80% of patients will have small bowel disease. Um, there have been a number of trials looking at mesalamine, um, various different formulations of the drug, um, and some of these have shown benefit, up to 40 to 50 percent remission, but these have not all been good quality studies. Um, Meta-analysis that was done actually found that although there was a st statistically significant difference as compared to placebo, there was not a clinically significant difference. And a Cochrane um, analysis also uh, found similar findings um, concluding that mesalamine was no different than placebo. Um, that being said, as I've said, these drugs are widely used in clinical practice, even though efficacy clearly isn't demonstrated in these trials. Um, that being said, I would like to say that I do think there's, there is a role for these medications in the treatment of mild Crohn's, um, particularly patients who have mild Crohn's who have never um, been exposed to steroids. So just a few... Um, words on the, the potential risks of these medications. Um, there's a lot of comfort with prescribing them because the, they are pretty low risk. Um, headaches, nausea, vo nausea, vomiting can be, seen, can be seen with these in 10% or more of patients, particularly with the sulfasalazines. Um, more severe complications are less frequently seen, like pancreatitis, um, interstitial nephritis. I'm going to say a few more words about interstitial nephritis. Um, although it's rare, um, it has had some medical legal implications. Um, the UK GPRD, um, uh, the, basically data from the UK, G, UK GPRD has been used to try and estimate the incidence of interstitial nephritis in patients who have IBD. Um, they identified 130 of 19,000 or so patients who had IBD who were taking 5-ASAs who had um, renal disease. And of that number, there was a very small number that actually had interstitial nephritis. So the incidence is it's quite rare. 
Um, the mechanism unknown is unknown, and the reaction appears to be idiosyncratic, but monitoring is actually re recommended on the package insert. Um, there's no clear data as to how to do this or clear guidelines in our literature as to how to go about uh, monitoring for this. Um, I typically will check a creatinine every six months to every year, um, but it's also not clear whether this is effective or cost effective. So moving on, our next case is that of a 33-year-old male who has a one-year history of Crohn's. Um, he's previously been treated with steroids and mesalamine. Um, he has abdominal pain and diarrhea that seem to be controlled on steroids, but as he tapers off his steroids, his symptoms recur. Uh, colonoscopy shows inflammation and ulcers in the terminal ileum and colon, and he has biopsies that are consistent with ileoclonic Crohn's. An MRI enterography shows no stricture, fistula, or abscess. And um, his doctor recommends initiation of azathioprine in conjunction with a steroid taper. So as you guys know, steroids are frequently used um, in the short-term induction of remission of patients with moderate to severe disease. Um, steroids come in various different formulations, IV and oral. Um, budesonide is, is a special steroid that's worth um, mentioning because it has limited systemic bioavailability um, and therefore less toxicity. Um, it is specifically effective for ileal and right-sided colonic disease. Um, it probably is a little bit less effective than conventional steroids, um, but it probably offers the best combination of short-term efficacy and, and safety in appropriate patients. So we know that steroids are very effective at inducing remission. Um, a 30-day population-based study on patients taking 40 to 60 milligrams of prednisone found that about 58% of those patients could achieve a complete remission, 26% um, partial response, and only 16% no response. Similar data um, has, or similar results have, have come forth from, place from placebo control trials as well. Um, but as I said before, these drugs are really not for maintenance. They're for induction, um, and they're not for maintenance in part because they do not reduce the risk of relapse, and they have bad long-term side effects, which you're all familiar with. Um, these include cataracts, glaucoma, diabetes, weight gain, hypertension, osteopenia, osteoporosis, acne, mood sleep distur disturbances, um, and infection. The actual incidence in the literature um, of these potential side effects varies um, and isn't well reported, um, but I think we all would, would agree that most patients gain weight um, when they're on steroids, and about a third of patients probably have cataracts, glaucoma, or mood disturbances with prolonged use of these medications. So, both because of the um, potential risks and bad side effects of these medications and the fact that these medications don't prevent relapse, um, we really try to minimize the use of steroids. So initiation of azathioprine was also uh, recommended for our patient. Um, azathioprine is an immunomodulator. Um, it's an oral medication. It has immune modifying properties. Um, it doesn't fully kick in for about three months or so, um, so it's not fast acting and that's why it's frequently prescribed with a steroid. Azathioprine is a prodrug for 6-mercaptopurine or 6-MP and the metabolism of these drugs um, depends on TPMT or uh, thiopurine methyltransferase. Um, absence or de deficiency of TPMT can result in severe le leukopenia, so we typically will check a TPMT level before we prescribe this medication to assist with dosing and to make sure that we're not giving somebody uh, unnecessary toxicity with that leukopenia. Um, so azathioprine is effective for inducing and maintaining remission in Crohn's. Um, this uh, graph shows results of a meta-analysis of eight randomized placebo control trials on the effectiveness of induction of remission compared with placebo. Um, as you can see, the overall response for azathioprine is about 54% compared with 33% for placebo, and the steroid sparing effects are 65% with azathioprine compared with 36% for placebo. Um, so, you know, there is, there is good data to say that azathioprine is effective for induction of remission and also has significant steroid sparing effects. Um, 
So in, in addition to being aware of the potential benefits of azathioprine, it's also important to know what the, what the potential risks of the medication are. Um, and they include um, bone marrow suppression, hepatotoxicity, pancreatitis, fatigue, nausea, flu-like symptoms, increased risk for infections, um, as well as increased risk for certain cancers. Um, because of the risk of bone marrow suppression and hepatotoxicity, we typically will follow regular CBC and LFTs on these patients um, for as long as they're on the medication. Um, the uh, potential risk of pancreatitis is most commonly seen in the first month after starting therapy. Um, and if it occurs, it basically means the patient cannot use the medication again. Um, the increased risk for infection is mostly for viral infections and includes HSV, CMV, and EBV. Um, and the odds ratio for infection appears to be about two to three. Lymphoma has also been associated with these medications, um, and there's been a reported about fourfold increased risk. So I'm just going to say a few more words about lymphoma because understandably many patients will get concerned about a risk of lymphoma when they're taking a, you know, a medication that can be associated with it. Um, the background incidence of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the U.S. is about 2 out of 10,000. Um, and a fourfold increase of that small number is still a pretty small number, which is why in most patients the benefit of this drug outweighs that potential risk. That being said, the risk of lymphoma is known to increase with age. Um, and if you're treating a bunch of 20-year-olds, you'd probably need to take, treat about 4,300 in order to cause one additional lymphoma per year. That number drops significantly um, to about 350 if you're treating 70-year-olds. Um, and that can obviously make for a more difficult decision when you're weighing risks and benefits. Hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma is another um, lymphoma that has been associated with azathioprine, and um, I mention it because it is usually fatal. Um, it's a very rare cancer. There have only been about 100 to 200 cases reported in the entire literature. Most cases are in young males, um, and of those, there have been about 36 cases associated with azathioprine. 16 cases in patients who are just on azathi azathioprine, and 20 cases in patients who are on azathioprine as well as a biologic or anti-TNF. Um, clearly, this is a serious consideration, particularly when you're talking about starting this medication in a young male. Um, but I think it's important to keep this in perspective. Um, and thankfully, more than 99.99% .99 of patients won't have this complication. So for the sake of time, I'm really only going to say a few words about methotrexate. Methotrexate is another immunomodulator that's used for the treatment of Crohn's. Um, it's given by sub-Q or IM injection, um, and there is good data to support its effectiveness in Crohn's. Here are some of the potential risks of methotrexate. Some of the more common risks are nausea and fatigue, abnormal LFTs, um, less likely uh, but more severe risks can include hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, uh, which can occur in about 1% of patients, or um, uh, hepatotoxicity resulting in fibrosis or cirrhosis. Um, so our third case. This is a 26-year-old female who has a two-year history of Crohn's. Uh, she's previously been treated with steroids and azathioprine. She has abdominal pain, diarrhea, and a perianal fistula. Um, her colonoscopy reveals inflammation and ulcers, pretty severe in the colon and in the terminal ileum. Um, she has an MRI enterography that reveals no evidence of stricture and no abscess. Uh, and her doctor recommends that she should start an anti-TNF. So TNF is a pro-inflammatory cytokine that has an important role in inflammation in Crohn's. Um, the anti-TNFs are antibodies that are um, directed against TNF-alpha. These meds are also used for the treatment of uh, rheumatoid arthritis and in other rheumatologic disorders. Um, there are three anti-TNFs that have been approved for Crohn's. These include infliximab, adalimumab, and sertilizumab. Infliximab was approved in 1998. Um, it's a mouse chimeric monoclonal antibody. It's given by way of an IV infusion with three induction doses followed by every eight-week dosing thereafter. Adalimumab is a fully human monoclonal antibody and it's given sub-Q, which is nice because it means that patients can give it to themselves. It's dosed every two weeks, um, and it's been in use since about 2007. 
Sertilizumab is also a sub-Q medication um, with maintenance dosing about monthly, and it's been in use since about 2008. So this slide highlights response and remission results from similar trials um, on infliximab, adalimumab, and sertilizumab in Crohn's. Um, as you can see, there's about a 60% short-term response with these medications and about a 40% remission rate with these medications compared to placebo rates of about 20%. So potential benefits of these medications are significant. They can obviously make patients feel better. Um, they can help us get patients off steroids. They can improve quality of life, decrease hospitalizations, decrease need for surgeries, um, and they have also uh, been shown to improve mucosal healing. But it's also important to be aware of the potential risks of these medications. Um, infusion or injection site reactions can occur. Um, there's an increased risk for infections, particularly reactivation of TB or hepatitis B, um, opportunistic infections, lymphoma, rarely demyelinating disorders or hepatotoxicity, um, drug-induced lupus. So um, this slide really outlines the serious infections um, that have been reported from completed infliximab trials. Um, serious infections have been reported um, in about 5.9% of patients getting drug compared to 3.9% in placebo. Um, and the infections that have been reported include pneumonia, abscess, cellulitis, sepsis, herpes, uh, zoster, and TB. So an additional um, biologic that's used in the treatment of Crohn's is natalizumab. Um, natalizumab is not an anti-TNF, but it's a, uh, an antibody against alpha-4 integrin, which is also um, involved in inflammation. Um, this medication is, is also used for MS. Um, it is typically, or it can only be used if somebody's actually failed an anti-TNF before, um, and it can't be combined with other immunosuppressant medications. It's given IV with, with monthly dosing. Um, this slide shows response and remission data for natalizumab um, at week 8 sustained through week 12 compared with placebo. Um, and you can see it's clearly better than placebo both for response and remission data. Other reported benefits have included steroid-free remission, improved quality of life, reduced hospitalization, and avoidance of surgery. The risks of natalizumab are, are similar to other immune-suppressing medications, but there's also an increased risk of PML um, or progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Um, this is an opportunistic infection um, that is caused by reactivation of the JC virus. Um, it results, it, it's, and it's basically a demyelinating brain disorder with a 50% associated mortality and potential persistent neurologic damage in people who survive. Um, as of December 2010, there have been about 79 cases out of 75,500 patients who have been treated with the medication, and most of these have been in MS. Clearly, this uh, potential complication of the medication has made most of us pretty conservative in our way of prescribing it and our use of it. So now you are completely bogged down with details of medical therapy of Crohn's, so I think it's um, a good idea to kind of take a step back and get a bigger, bigger picture historical perspective on the evolution of these medications. Um, interestingly, in the early 1900s, slop diets and vaccines were the treatments of choice for Crohn's. In the 1940s, we did have sulfasalazine um, and penicillin uh, was available and prescribed. In the 1950s, ACTH was discovered, and so that really ushered in the era of steroid use for Crohn's. Um, and in the 1960s, 6-MP and azathioprine became available. Um, the 1970s, sulfa-free amino salicylates were developed, and as I said, it wasn't until 1998 that infliximab um, became available for treatment of Crohn's, really starting the beginning of the biologic era for treatment of Crohn's. So when you look at this from a historical perspective, you can see that up until very recently, most of our treatment was pretty nonspecific, um, and it's only recently that it's become more targeted. Um, so now I'd like to move on to some of the currently debated questions in the treatment of Crohn's. What's commonly referred to as step-up versus top-down um, refers to the question of, is it better to start with the more mild medications and gradually offer more aggressive treatment in the treatment of Crohn's, um, to, or, or should we just offer more aggressive treatment from the get-go? Um, mucosal healing um, is really about 
asking what's the importance of mucosal healing and uh, should this be a treatment goal, treatment goal. Up until recently, most of our focus um, has been on just getting people to feel better. But this questions you know, whether or not getting people to feel better is, is enough. <coughs> and then combination versus monotherapy. Should we be combining anti-TNFs and immunomodulators for a potentially better response, or does the long-term risk of combination therapy outweigh that potential benefit? So this diagram, this pyramid, um, is typically used to explain the step-up approach to Crohn's therapy, which has been regarded as the, the conventional therapy um, at this point. It really starts with mild therapy, um, and as I said, you really just move to the next level um, as that previous level has been failed. Um, obviously, patients who have more severe disease start their treatment higher up in the pyramid, but the concept is that you start with more mild treatment and you move towards more aggressive treatment as patients fail the, the more mild therapies. Um, top down basically says that this pyramid should be flipped upside down and we should start with more aggressive therapy first. Um, and the thinking behind that um, is based on the fact that, that if you do that, you may be able to change the natural history of the disease um, and therefore better be able to prevent hospitalizations, surgeries, flares, um, and complications of the disease. So one study has investigated this um, by randomizing patients to early combined immunosuppression um, versus conventional therapy. Um, the conventional therapy arm started patients off with steroids and then added azathioprine and infliximab as needed. Um, the uh, early aggressive therapy started with induction infliximab and azathioprine and then subsequently gave episodic infliximab and steroids as needed. Um, neither of these treatment arms follow exactly what, what we do or what we would do um, as far as treatment goes. But, but it does provide some information, I think, um, to, to answer the question here. So what did they find? They, found, they did find that top-down was more effective um, at inducing remission and in minimizing steroid use. Um, and they also found that more patients in the top-down group could be characterized as a treatment success at two years of therapy compared to um, in the step-up group. And treatment success was, was defined as patients who were in remission and who, who actually could be off steroids and infliximab and didn't need to undergo a surgery. So based on this, I think, you know, top-down certainly does seem better. Um, but it's important to remember that there's a lot that we don't know about the long-term toxicity of this approach. And we also don't know if the goal of altering the natural history of the disease would actually be achieved by this approach. So this brings us to our second question, namely, should mucosal healing now be the goal? Um, we have data that suggests that mucosal healing is associated with fewer Crohn's-related hospitalizations. Um, and we have data that suggests that mucosal healing is also associated um, with uh, a greater likelihood of having a sustained remission off steroids. Um, this is a study where patients had been treated for two years and then had two years of su su subsequent follow-up. Um, and you can see that about 70% of patients who, who had complete endoscopic healing uh, went on to be able to achieve a steroid-free remission for the subsequent two years as compared to 27% in patients who um, had um, evidence of endoscopic disease. So certainly steroid-free remission and reduced hospitalizations are, are great outcomes, um, but we still have a lot of questions about mucosal healing. Um, we don't know if in order to have a good outcome you need to have complete mucosal healing or if partial healing will be adequate. Um, we don't know if the ends will justify the means, um, if, you know, achieving, if mucosal healing would be worth the potential increased risk of more aggressive drugs used to achieve it. Um, and we don't know what we should do if a patient actually feels great but has evidence of endoscopic disease on a colonoscopy. So the third question is combination versus monotherapy. Um, should patients be treated with both an immunomodulator and a biologic at the same time, or should they really just get one or the other? 
This is, uh, re these are results from a recent multi-center study that compared the efficacy of infliximab plus azathioprine to each of these drugs alone. Um, and as you can see, combination therapy clearly did better. Um, concerns in this situation also remain, however, regarding increased potential risk of infection, as well as, as I mentioned before, hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma with combination therapy. Um, so clearly, you know, ultimately the decision has to be an individualized assessment of benefit and risk. So what does the future hold? Um, ideally, what we would like to be able to do is to predict uh, an individual's prognosis early in the course of their disease so that we can then better target therapy. Perhaps we'd be able to um, reserve top-down or combination therapy to patients who are likely to have a more aggressive course uh, while treating patients who have more mild disease more conservatively um, in the hopes of avoiding those unnecessary risks. Although medications for the treatment of Crohn's have come a long way, as you, as you saw from that historical perspective, um, there is a definite need for new therapies. Um, current bi biologics <coughs> have been good. Um, they have decreased hospitalizations and surgeries and improved quality of life, but not everybody responds and there are safety concerns with these medications. Um, I think an oral biologic would be nice. Um, less expensive medications are certainly needed. Um, and uh, our armamentarium will surely expand as medications with new mechanisms of drug action are, are developed in the near future, hopefully. Any questions? Thank you.